Turn in your Bibles to the book of Jude, and we are still uh, using this as a diving board, you might say, to other things, but we are specifically now uh, going through each verse expositorily. Brother Tom? Amen. Amen. I'm glad Tom's alive, aren't you? Amen. So let's read a couple of verses here in Jude chapter 1. Let's start with verse 1 and we'll read through about 7 or 8. I believe 8. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, the brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful. And this is where people get the idea, and I believe they are correct, that he gave all diligence to write about the needful sal common salvation, but then he said it was needful. He changed direction. It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So there's a little change of direction there. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord having loved, saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those that believed not. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner giving themselves over to fornication, going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh despise dominion and speak evil of dignities. Now let's ask the Lord to help us tonight. Father, we thank you for this time together. Thank you for those that have gathered here together. And I pray now that you would take this scripture and you would use it mightily in our hearts and lives. For we know that apostasy abounds in America and around the world today. Thank you for the good report of Brother Eddie Wang thousands of people being saved in India and thousands of churches being established and Lord being people being baptized. Thank you for that good report that we heard tonight. And I pray now that you'll continue to bless Brother Eddie Wang with cancer, still trying to do the work of the Lord and encouraging people all around the world, especially China and now in India as well. I pray that you'll bless him, give him strength to do the work that he needs to do. But Lord, here we are. Good News Baptist Church in Greer, South Carolina, and we need your help. We need to expose these apostates wherever they are, and I pray that you'll help us to be wise. In Jesus' name, we pray, amen. The theme of the book of Jude is, somebody tell me, apostasy, that's correct. It is a departure from the faith and a denial of the faith. Now, that's my definition, but uh, that's pretty close to what it should be. So Jude has all of a sudden gone from thinking about preaching or teaching or writing a letter on salvation and the riches of salvation and the blessings of salvation to this theme, contending for the faith against these apostates. So we talked about the commencing of the epistle in verses one through four, and we found out a lot of things about that. There's the introduction to the epistle, and it begins with the greeter, and it's Jude the servant. And I like that. He's always a servant. I hope every single one of us can remember this. Be a servant. Amen? Everybody tries to be a leader. That's not godly. Everybody needs to be a servant. There are a lot of things about the servant, but we'll keep, we already talked about that. Then there's the uh, greeted, the people who are greeted. Those that are sanctified, 
by God the Father. That's speaking of salvation and those that are preserved in Jesus Christ. Thank God for eternal security and then those that are called and we thank the Lord for that. So we have these characteristics of the recipients and we need to remember them. So there's the greeter and there's the greeted and then here's the greeting. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied and we talked about that multiplication. I think that's very important. Then here's the intent of the epistle. It said, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints, unto the saints. There's the diligence, and we talked about that, and how we must be diligent in living for the Lord. And if we do something for Christ, we ought to be diligent in doing it for the Lord. And then there's the design in the writing. And then there's the divergence in the writing. He actually changed his mind and we talked about that. Now we talk about the characteristics of the apostates. Jews' intent is to show the believers the wickedness and doom of the apostates. These apostates are not to be believed and are not to be followed. So here we have in verse 4 a preview of the apostates. Certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. And every single time I read that, turning the grace of God into lascivious, I literally shudder. I cannot believe that statement that any person who claimed to be a believer can take the grace of God and make it sound like something lascivious. I'll talk about that a little bit. They turn the grace of God into lascivious and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. In the phrase, we have unawares. That means they slept, kept, crept in without people knowing it. They snuck into the church, as we might say. They slipped into the church. They didn't just come bold-facedly and say, I'm an apostate, I don't believe in Christ. No, they came in acting like they believed in Christ, acting like they believed the gospel message, acting like they had everything on the same level as the church, but in reality, they didn't have the same beliefs at all. They came in unaware. It's called deceitful infiltration. You know what the church probably thought? The church probably thought, wow, we've got some big leaders coming in here. We've got some good teachers coming in here. We've got some visitors in the church. Praise the Lord. And they didn't know that those visitors and those knowledgeable men were going to take them down a false path. I have often observed a phenomenon in the church. Men of knowledge or leadership ability will come, sometimes women, and they will slowly become part of the church family and slowly be given a position of leadership, especially in the area of teaching. And then after a while as they teach, a pet doctrine or hobby horse as we call it will slip out. Now really, it didn't slip out to the person that was doing it. The person that was doing it was purposefully waiting to unload this unusual doctrine. And the people didn't know it because, oh, this is a great person. This is a great man. This is a great woman. They are godly people. They live right, do right, think right, look right. They're part of us. And then this unbiblical doctrine pops out. I've seen it happen I don't know how many different times. Now, here's what usually will happen. Usually when that takes place in a church, one of two things is going to happen. Either that person will, by the grace of God and the help of God, and usually by the pastor's uh, discrimination, or I say discernment, maybe that's a better word, discernment, will move that person out quietly. That is the best way to do this. Move the ungodly or the false prophet or the false teacher move them out quietly and say nothing about it to the folks you say preacher why would you do that I'll tell you why you do that because when you start stirring up a stink you're going to get a stink amen 
My daddy said, when you bury a dead dog, don't dig it up. Amen? Amen? And so some people want to dig up all the dirt and say, why, why, why? Who did this? Why? Who did that? What did they say? And they want to dig up dirt and stir up stink. So the best thing for that, for that to happen is that false teacher to be quietly removed and nothing to be said. But a lot of times that doesn't happen. A lot of times the other thing happens. People begin to follow the false teacher. And that's exactly what they wanted. They wanted a fellowship. Can I tell you something real quick? I want to tell you something really, 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 really quick. We are not here to grab a following. We are here to serve Jesus Christ. Amen? We don't want disciples. We don't want people to say, those are mine. And if I leave, they'll leave. By the way, if you leave because somebody else leaves, something's wrong somewhere. Amen? I'm going to tell you something. We are not here to recruit people to follow us. We are here to serve the Lord Jesus Christ as a body, as one body. Amen. Is that right? So there are many false prophets in the world, and they are apostates. Now, these were, we're talking about apostates here in this passage. It might be a little bit different from some. Some, some of these people, I believe, are saved and sadly mistaken. Let me tell you, sir, not too long ago, and it's been a while back when Dr. Seitler was here, and Dr. Seitler said, Pastor Water, you ought to have so-and-so come and preach. I said, is that right? I said, yeah, I know that name. He had to be in his 80s. He was a retired missionary, lived in, right not far uh, down here in the state of South Carolina, and uh, I said, well, give me his number, and so I got his number, and I called this retired missionary that people all up and down the countryside know and I said uh, I, I, you know doctor yeah I know Dr. Seitler and I said uh, well I, he told me that I ought to call you and talk to you about a meeting or something he said well let me tell you something brother Dan up front now up front and I'm glad he was I'm glad he was honest he said I was uh, I believe Lutheran if I remember right before I got saved he said and I got saved and I've been in the mission field and so on. He said, but I'm returning to my Calvinistic roots. I said, that's all I need to know. How many of you know what Calvinism is? Where God determines this one can be saved and that one can be lost. These go to heaven and those go to hell. No, God doesn't determine people to say you're going to hell. Is that right? That's Calvinism. We don't believe in Calvinism. Amen. Amen. So he told me up front, and I'm glad he told me up front. And guess what? You think I invited him to come preach in this pulpit? No. But I do know that before I came here, that another teacher had been from another uh, college right here close by, and he was invited to preach in this pulpit, and he began to have influence over people in leadership at this church. And he was a Calvinist. I'm telling you, folks, you got to be careful about people. Somebody say amen. Yeah. Okay. So the next phrase says that therefore of old ordained to this condemnation, these people are not only de deceitful in infiltration, they are doomed in judgment. And here's what it says, before of old ordained to this condemnation, condemnation is judgment. Now, when it says that, it is not talking that they were predestined, like Calvinists believe, to judgment or to hell. It means that their day of reckoning is coming. It is not predestination of salvation. Their evil practices and tactics are what is being condemned. And God knows that certain people are going to choose these evil practices of infiltrating the church with false doctrine, and they are already doomed because he knows the ones that are going to take up this deceitful infiltration, and they are doomed in Job. Can I tell you something else, by the way? Let me just throw this out. I don't want you to get me wrong, but I believe people that infiltrate a church, 
for the purpose of tearing that church up or doing whatever. And by the way, I didn't bring that option in a while ago. I said just hopefully they get removed silently, quietly. But the other option is if they're not removed silently or quietly, the church ends up splitting over the doctrine. That's the other option because one will follow the pastor and the other will follow the false leader and the church will end up splitting. How many of you would rather have a person removed than to split the church? That's exactly what ought to happen. Well, anyway, <clears throat> this um, idea is that their practices are doomed and that dooms them. Now, let me say this about a Christian. Now, I think, I think this happens, folks. Now, you listen to me and you listen to me good. I'm not warning uh, in a way I'm warning, but I'm just telling you what I've seen. I've seen Christian people slip into a church, become part of the family, and next thing you know, they split a church wide open. I believe they're going to pay dearly at the judgment seat of Christ. Don't you? You know why they do that? They want to follow it. They, they want to glory. They don't want God to get the glory. They want to be the big dog. They want to be the big shot. They are false prophets. Let me tell you that. Any person who slip into a church and try to split that church over personalities is ungodly and are going to suffer judgment. Amen. Amen. How many of you have seen a church split? Is it fun? It's not fun. No fun about it. Does it help the community? No. Does it help the individual? No. It doesn't help them at all. So anybody can be saved. Even these false teachers here, apostates, they could have been saved. The Bible says in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But some people are not going to come to repentance. They're going to choose the wicked way. And the people in this chapter that Jude is talking about chose the wicked way. And God knew that, and they are condemned. It is their choice that condemned them. Can I say this carefully, clearly? Choices can either make or break your life. Choices can either make or break your life. What choice are you making? The choices are very important. They chose a certain way, and it was the way of death. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 30, verse 19, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. That's a promise of your people, children, grandchildren, doing the things that are right. So you choose either life or you choose death. And your choices are doing that. Every time you make a choice, every time you make a choice, you're choosing the life or death. So these men are deceitful in their infiltration and they are doomed in judgment. And next we will see that they are desecrated in their actions. Apostates are immoral. You say, how do you know that? They turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. How many of you have noticed that it seems like some of these, quote, television personalities that preach on the airwaves end up in immorality? Have you ever noticed that? Well, what is the big deal? Apostates are immoral. It's that simple. By the way, Christian people don't need to be immoral. They need to be moral. Is that right? Amen. But I want you to know something. Here, and here's another thing. I want you to, if you're wrong on doctrine, it's easy to get immoral. If you're wrong on doctrine, it's easy to get immoral. Here's what Paul said to Titus. Here's exactly what he said about these apostates. Whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not, for filthy lucre's sake. Money. Preaching for money. Teaching for money. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, the Christians are always liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies. You say, what was that? Filthy lucre means they're greedy. And then when they talk about the Grecians being slow bellies, they're racist. So these people are radical, greedy, racist. That's what they are. This is one of the most wicked things that I can think of that anyone could do. They turned the grace of God into lasciviousness. 
I don't know of a more important truth than the grace of God. I, I mentioned it this morning, the riches of his grace. I mentioned that, and I, I want you to know something. I wish that I could describe to you the meditation that I had for just a few minutes on the riches of the grace of God. It is so powerful. It is so I'm so glad that God is favorable to us who are unfavorable. Amen? I'm glad he loves us because we don't deserve his love. We don't deserve his mercy. We don't deserve anything. But he is good to us. That's the grace of God. And just think about the riches of his grace in everything, in everything. But these men turned that rich grace into lasciviousness. You say, what is lasciviousness? Well, when it comes to legality, that, by the way, do you know that there, there's legal terms that use the word lascivious behavior? Legal terms in the state of South Carolina and other states? It is the behavior that precedes rape. That's the way they kind of describe it legally. But here's what I would say. Any sexual perversion of any kind could be called lasciviousness. These men, these apostates, had taken the grace of God to mean that a person could participate in lascivious behavior without any guilt whatsoever. None whatsoever. And they were trying to make all the people immoral and not feel guilty about it. By the way, I don't care how many people try to teach you something so you don't feel guilty. A person knows if they got a conscience, and I believe everybody does, and a person also knows by, if they know anything about the Bible, immorality is immorality. It's wrong. And your heart will tell you it's wrong. I don't care how many people preach, oh, that's the grace of you could the grace of God overlooks that. By the way, the grace of God doesn't overlook sin. Is that right? The grace of God gives me power and the desire not to sin. That's what the grace of God does. It doesn't cover the only thing that covers sin is the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Is that right? Amen. So all the, and I, and I don't want to even name uh, all these things. But let, let me just say this. What a blasphemy it is for someone to take the grace of God, the great, wonderful riches of the grace of God, and say, this is permitting these sexual activities of lust. How blasphemous can a person be? The grace of God never violates the holiness of God. One of the first acts considered, now listen to this, I'm just preaching, and this is in the state of South Carolina and other states in the United States as well. The United States generally, generally speaking, the first lascivious act in legal law was cohabitation. That was the first case of, of a lascivious behavior, cohabiting. It was a violation of the law. Do you know that only recently, only recently has the state of Florida changed that law about cohabitation, be lascivious behavior? Recently, Florida, my, it was the other fellow before this governor, not DeSantis, but Scott, I believe, is that far back, changed that law about cohabitation being lascivious behavior. Almost every other state, South Carolina doesn't have it anymore. You can look at the laws of marriage on the state of South Carolina. You can look them up. It doesn't say cohabitation is a lascivious behavior, but it did. It used to be against the law to cohabit. It used to be. It used to be against the law, but it's no longer against the law. Now you have laws that say if a person has lived together for such and such a time, they are considered man and wife just as much as those that go to the altar and perform the ceremony. They have what they call common law marriages now. And that state of South Carolina recognizes common law marriages. But I'm just making this statement. It used to be in South Carolina and other states, cohabitation was against the law. It was called lascivious behavior. Now can you imagine with me just imagine with me, a religious leader, I'm talking about a religious leader tolerating and approving 
some kind of sexual perversions in the church. Can you imagine a pastor saying, this is all right, go ahead. You can be this way, you can be that way. Just go right ahead, that's fine. By the way, we have that going on. It split the Methodist church. The Methodist church has split over this issue. Oh, yeah. Some people believe, hey, you ought to believe it. what's moral is moral, what's right is right. And then there's another crowd that says, no, you ought to uh, let this happen and let that happen, et cetera, and so on. So it split the Methodist church. By the way, if I were a Methodist, I'd definitely want to be on the side of those old traditional Methodists who say, no, that's wrong. Amen? Amen. I cannot, I cannot imagine any religious leader of any stripe or color, taking the great grace of God and using it as permission to do all kind of immoral things. So these, the Bible says, <clears throat> God forbid, in other words, should we continue in sin that grace may abound, the Bible says in Romans chapter six. In other words, should we continue in sin that the grace may abound? That's turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. And in that Romans chapter 6 passage, Paul emphatically in the Holy Spirit says, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? No way. We're not going to do that. Romans 6, 2 is what I just quoted. These men are deceitful in infiltration of the church. They slip in unawares. They are doomed in judgment. They have a path of death attached to them just like a sign. And anybody that follows those that have that death sentence over them is headed in the same direction. And they are desecrated in their actions and they are defiled in their creed. That's talking about that very grace of God. And number five, they were deniers of Christ. This is the main thing. They might not have started out denying Christ, but they ended up teaching, oh no, Christ is not who he, we say he is, what the Bible said. Christ was just a human. He was just like we are. And of course, the Gnostics of the early first century, they were the ones that were doing some of this right away. And this is what Jude is probably talking about. Jude is probably talking about those Gnostics who had already slipped into the church and were teaching their false doctrine that Christ was not uh, God because matter is all matter is evil and so on and so on and so on. Now, you'd have to study, our Bible Institute goes all through that. You'd have to study that. But you can look up the Gnostics and find out what they believe, and they didn't believe that Christ was God. By the way, anybody that denies that Christ is God is a heretic. They're an apostate. Amen? Jehovah's Witness do not think that Christ is God. They're heretics. Amen? The Mormons do not believe that Christ is God. Heretics. Is that right? Amen. You say, well, preacher, it's easy to denounce the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witness and all those people. Do you know that as I began to unload this, so to speak, I saw things that I had never seen before all across America. How many of you, and I know several of you probably have, how many of you ever heard of the emergent church? Anybody heard of the emergent church? See, another heresy, another apostate group Starts out in California, real strong in California. By the way, a lot of evil things start in California, don't they? But if you you go home and look it up, emergent church. Look it up. I, I challenge you, they're apostates. That's what they are. But I saw one. That was just one. And then I, I, as I read and read and read, more. Here's another one, and here's another one, and here's another. It would take me the rest of my ministry here to expose all the apostates that I read about this week. The rest of my ministry. I could preach every single service on another apostate and explain their errors, and it would take me the rest of my ministry to do that. I'll tell you what I am going to do. Since you don't know much about the emergent church, I think I'll bring that up. I think I'll go look it up and I think I'll study it a little bit and I'll bring some of that to you in this passage, in on Sunday nights. And so every now and then I'm going to preach on this apostasy and the groups that are apostate now. But I'll tell you something else I'm going to preach on. I have more requests for this last Sunday sermon on the last times. People really are discussing the last times right now. A lot of people. 
It's, it's on everybody's mind. We're living in the last days. We talked to somebody yesterday, didn't believe in the rapture. I said, I disagree with you. Kindly. You say, preacher, is it right? Some people don't believe. Oh, yeah, there's a lot of people who don't believe in the rapture. You say, well, how do you tell them? What do you tell them? Well, I'll tell you one thing for sure. There's a catching up, and it's not the same thing as coming again. Catching up and coming again are two different things. Amen. You look it up. You study it yourself. You say, preacher, why won't you get up there and do it? I will. But you need to look up the catching away in 1 Thessalonians, and then you need to look up the coming of Christ again, Matthew chapter 24. You need to. And in Matthew chapter 24, if I'm not mistaken, it's got some verses that talk about the catching up part, and then it's all of a sudden changes to the coming again. you got to know from one verse to the next which ones it's talking about. Well, you better get on your ball. Hey, you say, preacher, what should I do? Well, you better get in your Bible and think about some things and study some things. How about that? Amen? Because there's people out there that want to know. They're going to tell you, I had a fellow that came to church here, sat right here about on the third row, and he said, the rapture's not in the Bible. I said, it doesn't matter if the rapture's in the Bible or not. I said, what matters is there's a catching up and there's a coming again, and they're two different things. Amen? How many of you know there's two different comings? Yeah. And some people getting it all together, putting it all together. You can be quiet I mean, and serious and calm and not loud mouth and bold and boisterous and argumentative and still preach the gospel. So they denied the very Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I, how many of, I know you've heard this term and I, I'm closing with this illustration. How many of you have heard this term, the God within us, right? Right, everybody heard the God within us phrase? Anybody not heard of it? Everybody's heard of this phrase, the God within us, right? Okay, good. Some people, I don't know if I heard it or not. The God within us. Where'd that come from? Is that true? Is that right? Now, how many of you think, just from listening to the phrase, the God within us, how many of you think that's right? How many of you think it's wrong? Three people think it's wrong. How many of you don't know? <laughs> Let me tell you where it came from, okay? Are you ready for this? How many of you are ready to find out where the God was sent? By the way, who believes it and preaches it the most? I'll tell you who. Oprah. Oprah preaches the God with it. Where'd she get, where'd Oprah get it? Where'd she get that? By the way, Oprah's an apostate. You are. You ought to read the life. I don't know if you could read it or not, but our Dr. John Yates tells us about that. Oprah was in a Bible-believing church before she turned to this. And because she heard a message on how God hates sin, she said, the God that I believe in is not a God of hate. How many of you believe God hates sin? Yeah. Does that mean he hates like we hate God can hate with no sin whatsoever. So she heard this message as a young person of how God is angry at sinners and hates sin, etc. And she turned from the gospel that is in the Bible and began to weave and read different people and came up with this gospel, the God within us. But it wasn't her idea. She read it from somebody else. So let me read a little bit and tell you where it comes from. This false doctrine of the God within us comes from Carl Jung. He was born July 26, 1875 to Paul Achilles Long Jung and, Protestant, and a Protestant minister. The, the minister, Carl, Paul Achilles Jung, was a Protestant. Can, can I tell you something? This Carl Jung is a preacher's kid gone bad. Now you think about that. This is a preacher's kid. Protestant minister's kid, Carl Jung. So his dad was a minister, and he married Emily Priswork. One author, Richard Doe, writes with the Jungarian movement and its merger with the New Age spirituality of the late 20th century. By the way, I don't have time to preach on the New Age movement, but how many of you know that the New Age movement is also apostate? I mean, that's easy. That one's easy. But there's books this thick you can read about the New Age movement. Don't have time to go on that. I might do some of it. I'm not sure. He said that uh, this Jungarian movement 
and we haven't got to what it believes yet, merged with the new age spirituality of the late 20th century. And it says, we're witnessing the incipient stages of a faith based on the uh, apotheosis of Jung as a God-man. Jung himself is considered a God-man by the Jungarian movement. How many of you know there's not but one God-man? There's one mediator between God-man, the man Christ Jesus. Is that right? All right, we need to know that verse and we need to know where to find it. Does anybody know where to find it? You can look it up, but I think it's in the book of Titus. But you just look it up. All right, in 1936-1939, a Swiss psychologist, Carl Gustav Jung, began sending, listen to what he did. He sent out his anointed disciples from Zurich to Britain and to the United States to spread his Jungarian doctrine. Sent out his disciples. They were marked by a revival of paganism and infatuation, infatuation with the Nitschian cult of personality. Think about that one. I don't have time to go into that personality thing. How many of you remember, not too many years ago, everybody was preaching and teaching about personalities? Anybody remember that 10, 15 years ago? Oh, man, I can remember that. I even got into it and preached on about, I forgot how many, 19 different personalities I preached on one time. But I was not preaching at it from the point of these other people. I preached on it from the gospel's sake. But there's so many different types of personalities, et cetera. But that's, this is part of it. And then not only the personality cult, but uh, obsession with the occult in which eroticism, mysticism, uh, and particularly the theosophy, theosophy of Alice Bailey and Madame Blavatsky, a cult of neophilia, that's that which is new, the love of the new, reign supreme. And then I'm just reading a little quotes. If we view Christ as a human being, then it makes absolutely no sense to regard him in any way as a compelling model for our action. John Garion, John Carl Jung says, if Christ is just human, by the way, is he 100%, is Christ 100% human? Is he? Is Christ 100% human? Amen or oh me? Amen. Is he 100% God? He's both. Is that right? So he said, it, this junk Aaron thing says if he's human in any way, then he is no model for us because he's human. That's what John Gary. So they're denying Christ. So these in this Jew, in the book of Jude, they were denying Christ. Carl Jung was denying Christ. And this, this thing is going on and on and on. So let me continue right quick. To Jung, honoring God now meant honoring the libido. How many of you seen commercials with the word libido in it? Anybody seen a commercial with the word libido? Anybody beside me and Tim and Dottie? Anybody see a commercial with a libido? Okay. Three of us watch, four of us watch television. <laughs> Five of us, okay. Commercials specifically on male uh, supplements and say it's a libido. Wait just a minute. Libido means this force within or God. So there's where you start getting you start getting this idea of the God within. So next time you see a commercial with libido in it, it's talking about that force or that God within. You think about it. It's amazing. It's a vital force. And it's the God. By the way, I want you to know something. My male libido and your female libido is not the God within you. I have a new nature. And that's the God within me. Amen? And it's all because of Jesus Christ and his shed blood on the cross of Calvary. If it were not for the gospel of Jesus Christ, I would have no new nature. But thank God I got a new nature that has never sinned. Never. You say, preacher, you, you do sin. Yeah, but that's the old nature. Amen. I, got a, I got an old nature that is depraved and sick. It is not worth a nickel. It is raunchy, bad, terrible. But thank God I got a new nature that overcomes it. Amen. Amen. Well, let me, I got to quit. <clears throat> Jung offers the psychoanalytic term libido as a mystical substitute for vital force or even God. Just as we feel the surge of vital power within us as living biological beings, so then we are also experiencing the God within, Jungarian. This is 1930, folks. And from 1930, the Jungarian movement has swept across America and the world and now people 
great personalities on TV are teaching the God within. Dr. John Kerr showed in his important book, uh, Jung's drive to formulate a new religion was a result of trying to justify his own sins, the betrayal of his wife, and the betrayal and seduction of his patient, Sabina Spilrin. You ought to... Th Listen, Carl Jung was immoral. Uh, by the way, apostates are immoral. Carl Jung was immoral with his Sabina Spilring. Sabina Spilring was the daughter of a wealthy Jewish family. And her grandfather was a rabbi. And she was brilliant. And she was one of the first people that began to study psycho analysis along with Jung and Freud one of the first but she had a breakdown her sister died she had a breakdown at age 18 she ended up in a sanitarium and in that sanitarium was a an assistant named Carl Jung and she fell in love with Carl Jung and they were lovers for years and she has written about the destruction inside of you now that's an amazing thought. But anyway, she was one of the, she's considered one of the pioneers of the psychoanalysis movement. By the way, I want to tell you something. Some of these psychiatrists are nuts. Is that right? They're nuts. This girl had a breakdown and she's having all kind of problems with Carl Jung. Well, anyway, they wanted a better religion. She, Freud, and others, and Jung, and Sabina, Spielrein, wanted a new religion. And it was all about this God within us. At the bottom, Jung betrayed his father, his wife, his patient, and of course Christ. In trying to ease the rebukes of his conscience. Now I want you to listen to this. This is what he taught. See if you've ever heard this term before. And I've got to quit. But listen to this term. He said, now I'm quoting... I'm quoting from Jung. He said, Husbands and wives should not begrudge each other whatever erotic stimuli they may present themselves. Jealousy is something mean. Just as one has several people for friends, one can have sexual union with several people at any given period and be faithful to each one. How many of you know that's wrong? But has the world accepted that as the gospel? The world has accepted what Jung said as the gospel. As long as you're faithful, you can do whatever you want to do. That's turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. That's what they were doing. That's what Jung did. And then he said, now listen, tell me if you've ever heard this phrase. Free love. Where did you hear that? 60s? Hippie movement? Did you? How many of you heard the term? Jung. Here's what he said. Free love will save the world. The hippies took it hook, line, and sinker. And I ask you this question. Did it work? Rampant immorality, rampant marijuana use, and look where we are today. Amen? 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 The society is going to hell in a handbasket because of the Jung people. Amen? And it's amazing. This started way back in the 30s, 20s and 30s. This started way back there. And here it is. The fruit is rotten. You say, what can we do? I'll tell you what you better do. You better keep telling people about Christ. I better keep telling people about Christ. I better keep passing out gospel tracts. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.